Good morning, church. I'm Joshua Valdez. I'm the co-director of the broadcast and media. And I'm here to share the word of God with you today. Uh, Psalm 95 reads, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Amen. Is everyone ready to shout? All right, that's what scripture says, and that we will do. Hymn 231 is come, Christians, join to sing. If you're able, let's stand together and let's worship. joy to hear you worship this morning. Would you help welcome those around you who have come to do that this morning? If you are worshiping by way of television or live stream, we just want to thank God for you. We count you as a part of our family. What happens here is happening in your home, your hospital bed, wherever you may be. So take seriously this hour and this opportunity to worship the Lord this morning. Thank you for making this a priority. God bless you and welcome to worship. Amen. Welcome to worship, everybody. It is a joy that we get to worship together. Thank you for being here. For those of you who are new in the room with us, we want to get to know you. The way we do that are these cards that look like this. If you take one of these and fill it out and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service, this is how we get to know your name. Similarly, for those watching on television today, we want to know you as well. If you go to our website, fbcsa.org, There's a connect button at the top of the page that gives you an online version of this card, and we can get to know you in that way. Today, as we come into this place, we expect the Spirit of God to move. One of the things that I hope you'll anticipate with us in the movement of the Spirit of God is that as the Spirit of God comes upon His people, His people change. We can't come into contact with the Holy Spirit and remain the same. But I want you to listen carefully and pray diligently, seeking the Lord in this. 
as the Lord descends upon his church, how is he working? How is he correcting? Because we, as children of the King of Kings, will respond to him in faithful obedience. Or that's our prayer. Is that every one of you, every one of us in here will respond to the movement of the Spirit in the correction of our lives for the glory of the Lord. And so may we be faithful as the Spirit of God moves in this place. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And we know that you love us. And Lord, we pray that in that love we would respond faithfully to you. In all the ways that you correct us, in all the ways that you instruct us, in every way that you discipline us, Lord, we pray that we would receive it as good children, as children who love you and trust you. And Lord, we pray today that we would receive your word and be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we would be more like the Christ today than we were before. And Lord, we ask that you would come upon us and bring new life. And Lord, that our worship, our time together, our lives would be defined in this newness, found in the Spirit and not of ourselves. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you are new to our fellowship, one of the hallmarks of who we are as a body of believers is this thing we call reverse, where we revisit the scripture as a, bo- as a, as a corporate body every day throughout the week in preparation for our, our time together on Sunday. And so we've been studying the book of Proverbs these last several weeks. Now, I've got to confess to you, spirit of full disclosure, I rarely go around chanting the reverse text in my house as much as I have gone around my home chanting, spare the rod, spoil the child. It, it, might, it might have come out of my mouth several times this week, uh, but as we approach this, this um, series of discipline, that to be a disciple is to be one that is, is grounded in what we're called to be. And that means sometimes we are called back, sometimes we are corrected and challenged. So there's much scripture that parallels this, this teaching in Proverbs. One of them is found in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4. You follow along and, and you, you hear the word of the Lord. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sins. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have been become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Thanks be to God. Let's continue our worship, everyone. We are in the Easter season. As long as we gather on a Sunday, we are in the Easter season. Let's continue to sing of that resurrection. Hymn 166, He is risen, He is risen. Standing, if you're able.
children, come meet me down on the steps. Come on down. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. Good morning. Come down. It's good to see you all this morning. Ooh, where you got? That pin. Oh, that's a pin car. That's or a car pin. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, come on down, everybody. You're good. You still got time. Come down. Good morning. All right. Amen. Okay, I think we about got everybody now. All right, as we have been going through this proverb sermon series. Pastor Jimmy. Do you all know Pastor Jimmy, our children's pastor? Pastor Jimmy has been doing all these slides for us. So they're always a surprise. But I will tell you, I saw the slides early this week and there is a trick. Okay? So in a minute, we're going to be looking. So what we do in here is Proverbs or not. Right? So Pastor Jimmy. Yeah, there we go. Proverbs or not. And Pastor Jimmy, what he does for us is he puts three slides up. Uh, two of them are not a proverb, and one of them is a proverb. But I'm telling you right now, he's trying to trick us this week, okay? So keep that in mind as we look at these. So we're going to look at all three of these slides. Here we go. Proverbs or not? All right. For the A, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's A, all right? B, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. So that's B. And then C, if we discipline our kids, they will grow up to be Christians. All right. So Pastor Jimmy gave us three options here. And so let's see. We're going to pick out which one is Scripture and which one isn't Scripture. All right. We want to know the Word of God well enough that we can tell the difference week in and week out. And one of these is our reverse text for the week. All right. So let's check it. Uh, A, spare the rod, spoil the child. Is that Scripture? No. no. Well, Jimmy's trying to trick us here. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at the next one. Let's do B. What is, what is B there? Oh, there we go. Oh, I forgot to ask you. Is that scripture? <laughs> yes. Oh, I forgot to ask. Which, all right, the next one. Let's look at C. Oh, if we discipline our kids, they will grow up to be Christians. Is that one scripture? No, no that was not scripture. I, I can't believe I messed it up today, didn't I? I showed you the answers before I asked you the question. But Jimmy threw me off. Let's go back. Uh, Catherine, can you put back up there all three of them together? Let's go back and look at all three of them together. Now, really, those first two are both scripture, aren't they? Because that first line is basically the same as the first line of our reverse text. So what, what we wanted to talk about this week is we have to be real careful when we take scripture and make sure we take scripture exactly and take the whole thing. Something that we like to do is sometimes we like to pick out half of a verse or half of a text when there's more to it. And so that's what we want to talk about today. Really, A and B are both scripture, but we want to make sure we do the whole thing. And then C is just false. That's not true at all, is it? All right. Well, I want you to listen carefully for answer B, because that's what we're going to talk about in the sermon today. And we're going to talk about in the sermon today how our parents discipline us. And I suspect every one of you have had to deal with that at some point or another, right? All right, well, let's pray together and see how God instructs us in that way. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, and we pray that your word would be impressed on our hearts. Lord, that you would make us good and holy by the power of your spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would make it so in each one of these students. Build them up into great men and women of God with the word implanted and imprinted upon them deeply. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, thank y'all. So pastor just revealed to my children that I've been misquoting the scripture all week long. <laughs> I, I repent again, so in front of everyone. 
Let's continue to worship everybody. It's God, our Father, you have led us, hymn 454. Let's stand together if you're able and let's sing. We've had one verse all week long, Proverbs 13, 24 is our reverse text. If you would, find that and we're going to read this aloud together. This then is the text for today. He who withholds the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. May God bless the reading of his word. Spare the rod, spoil the child. It is what we quote often. And for grace towards Pastor Aaron as he walks, that is a a fair assessment of Proverbs 13, 24. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And we say it often. And there's a couple of places in particular where we often hear, spare the rod, spoil the child, that I want us to be careful with and careful about. So one of the places that you often hear, spare the rod, spoil the child, is when someone else's child is greatly annoying you. And when someone else's child is running through the hallway and knocking your stuff over, it quickly comes to mind, spare the rod, spoil the child. And sometimes we even say it out loud. It's meant to be a judgment. It's like when we've gathered together with family and our sister's kids are behaving wildly and we look at her and we say, hey, spare the rod, spoil the child. It's, it's, it's a condemnation that we use against others' parenting. And with that, I would be careful. There's another time we we often use it. Often you'll, you'll find it in your own anger 
that as you become enraged, right, it becomes a, a part of your discipline of your children. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And one of the things that we often do, it's very easy for that to become something far more than it was intended to be. That out of that, we let our emotions take over and lead us down a path that Scripture never intended. There have been plenty who have used this verse to justify their abuse and to justify their punishment when God never intended for that pain. But as we come to this Proverbs 13, 24, we need to, to recognize fully what the Scripture is teaching us here. That it is good and it is holy to discipline your children. And the opposite of that is it is disobedient to the Lord if you refuse to discipline your children. That your children, my children, all of our children, they need strict discipline. And, and they need to be disciplined diligently. So if you get to the end of that verse, it, it talks about this diligence and discipline that is a, a wise path in and of itself. It's interesting that that phrase has another connotation to it that I think helps us. There is some sense of this, this phrase of discipline diligently being connected to the dawn, the rising of the sun. And I think a, a connection that we can make here is that diligent discipline is discipline that is thoughtful, it's discipline that is intentional, and it's discipline that is consistent. That this is what our children need, thoughtful, consistent discipline. And whatever that looks like, whether that's verbal or, or physical or environmental or whatever the discipline is for each of our children, they are in desperate need of discipline. Every single one of them. It takes your thought, it takes your time, it takes your energy, and it takes that from an unclouded mind. Where we start to get off course with this is when we try to develop what discipline looks like in, in the heat of the moment, in, in the, 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 the emotional difficulty of parenting. If our dis discipline arises out of the emotion of the moment, it will fall apart. And so when it talks about this, this diligent discipline here, it's not discipline that arrives in the moment, but it's thoughtfully and wisely prepared for the day that it is needed. That as parents, we need to assume that our children will need our discipline. They are not perfect little angels like they sometimes look when they're laying in their beds with their eyes closed. That once they get up, there is going to be a need for discipline. Before the dawn, we should know the plan and stick to it. Discipline diligently. And, you know, one of the things that we recognize here in our flesh is that if we don't discipline our children, parenting becomes so much easier. If, if you just ignore them, and if you just completely ignore their behavior, your life just becomes all the more easier if you let go of that responsibility. And at that point, if you let go of their discipline, you have far more time to indulge yourself in that which you, your flesh, wants to do. And there's so many of us as parents who feel like we don't have the time, effort, energy to discipline our children, and so we just let it go. We would rather indulge ourselves than take care of the responsibility of disciplining our children. But since we're about to move, and you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And as we work into Hebrews chapter 12, Pastor Aaron read it earlier, that when when you do this, when you refuse to discipline your children to God above and to the earth all around, what you are saying is, I disown my children. 
They are no longer mine. They are no longer my responsibility. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. And look, look with me here at verse 8. So Hebrews 12, 8. But if, if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The refusal of discipline means you are giving up your parenthood. When you, when you ignore your child's behavior, you are saying, and you see in Proverbs 1, I hate them, is how Proverbs describes it. Hebrews 12 describes it as you have given up on your children and they no longer belong to you. We wouldn't say that out loud, but that is the reality of the situation when we do not discipline our children. And I want you to recognize in this diligent discipline, there is a daily pattern to this, that with your children and for your children, you will be intimately and daily involved in their behavior. That you are near to them and you're working with them and you, you are in their life. You will not let them get away with it, whatever it is. And that you are going to be there and you're going to be near them and you're going to talk with them and you're going to work through life's most difficult and painful moments with them. To not do that is irresponsible. To, to stay out of their life and be hands off is unbiblical. Hands off parenting is sinful. And, and as you let them run, you're moving further and further away from God as you move further and further away from them. You are to be actively involved in their life. Now, we do want to make a note here that on some level, this changes into adulthood. And that interaction and those relationships will be altered a bit once we move out of the house or get married those kinds of things, it changes the relationship, but there's still something there between parent and child. So I want you to recognize, as we, we look at Proverbs thirteen twenty four, that's the lesser truth this morning. That the, the lesser truth is, is our interactions with one another and the wisdom and the temporal reality of us disciplining our children as they grow from 10 to 12 to 14 to 18. That's the lesser reality this morning. There's a greater reality that this relationship between parent and child points heavenward and points to the reality of who God is in our life. If you look with me at Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12 pr quotes Proverbs 3 uh, uh, in verse 6, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he scourges every son whom he receives. And look down with me, Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards, it yields to the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God loves you and as a heavenly father is intimately involved daily in your life. As a good and perfect example of a father, God is near and God is correcting always. You know, we've, we've all had examples in our own homes of parents who, who disciplined us or guardians who disciplined us. And in their earthly state, they made mistakes. My parents made mistakes. Your parents made mistakes. But what we recognize, what that's pointing to, is a heavenly Father who is perfect and He makes no mistakes when it comes to your discipline and your correction. And He is there day in and day out putting in the work and the effort so that you can know the wise way forward. This is one of the great joys of being a child of God is that God is with you and walking right next to you through everything that you're going through in this life. And there will be days that he will correct you and rebuke you and scourge you. And that's because he loves you dearly. You see, God is not some disinterested guardian. But God is near and he's, he's, he's grabbing you by your coat and pulling you forward and saying, this way, my son, this way, my daughter, walk with me and all will be well. 
Today's discipline is tomorrow's fruit. Today's discipline is, is tomorrow's joy. This is where Hebrews 12 takes us. When God disciplines, he always gets it right and you are always better for it. We, we can't make that claim with our earthly parents because they, they didn't always get it right. God always gets it right. When, when he disciplines you, and out of heaven, his mighty hand comes into your life as correction. It is always for your benefit. And you will always be better for it. And so we, as children of the Most High One, it's our responsibility then to respond as faithful sons and daughters of God. Think about how you discipline your children. And, and we know how our children respond. Right? Rarely do they respond how we want them to respond. But, but as you think about how, how you want your children to respond to your discipline in their lives, that's how you need to respond to God's discipline as a good and faithful daughter, as a good and faithful son. To receive it and know that it's coming from a place of love and hopefulness. And to receive God's correction and so that you adjust your life immediately to where God is correcting you. So many of us still act like a toddler throwing a tantrum in the supermarket when God's correction comes into our life. There's still so many of us, when, when the corrective hand of God moves us in a different direction, we run away from him as, as fast as possible. We look like Jonah fleeing on the sea, away from God as quickly as possible. But how, how would you want your kids, how do you want them to respond when you discipline them? What heart do you want them to have? What attitude do you want them to have? What action do you want them to have? Because you and I, we keep fighting God like an unruly teenager. As God adjusts, we need to respond as faithful sons and daughters. So we see the, the lesser truth is that parents must discipline their children. The, the greater truth is that God always disciplines his children. It is a constant in our lives. And, and now more specifically, to recognize that, that God is disciplining us. You and I as individuals, and God is disciplining us as the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. And, and we receive this because we know this is evidence of his love. That, that's what you hear in Proverbs. That's what you hear in Hebrews. That's what you hear in Revelation. And if you'll turn with me, we're going to look lastly at Revelation chapter 3. That this is evidence that God loves you and the Holy Spirit is moving when the Holy Spirit moves, you will know the discipline of God and you will be required to change. That your life will look different than it did before. The old ways don't work anymore. The, the Spirit brings this new life of holiness that's different. So if you'll turn with me to, to Revelation chapter 3. God disciplines us. And as you look at Revelation 3, look at verse 14. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, and then look at 22, where it ends. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Th this discipline that we're talking about in each of these texts, and this discipline we're talking about in Revelation, it's, it's discipline on believers. It's discipline on the church itself. Because I want to make a distinction here. We, we know that the wrath of God is fiery and terrible. And, and sometimes we see that in the lives of those who don't believe. Sometimes we see the, the, the judgment of God brimstone from heaven on those who don't trust and believe in God. That certainly that wrath is real and it comes. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. 
What we're talking about this morning is the discipline of the heavenly father upon his children. And in particular, the church, in particular, you and I, and, and this church, where, where does the discipline of God show up? And as I've studied in recent months, I think this message of the church at Laodicea is for us. For us as American Christians, I think this should be read in every American church and, and should be known to us here at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. To the message of the church at Laodicea, it starts... Jesus' word in, let's look at 15 and 16. I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. One of the things I hear in this, he's saying, church, you, you have lost your care for that which God cares about. He says, well, you're not cold or hot. You, you, you don't have that, that heart for God's ways. You, you, don't, you don't have that, that deep care for what God is doing in this life and in this world. So do you care at all about what God cares about? Well, there's a direct connection here to the sin of Asidia. The, the sin of acedia is most often translated something like sloth or laziness. Inactive people, just inert. But I want us to be careful and separate it out from laziness a little bit because it's, that's not exactly what the sin of acedia is. The sin of acedia is you know what should be done, you know what's supposed to be done, but you don't care enough to actually do it. You think, eh, I should do that. But it never happens. And, and it's because you don't care enough. Your, your heart's not in it. That, that's what the sin of acedia is. The care in your heart is just nothing anymore. And as Jesus says, you're lukewarm. Why don't you care about the things that God cares about? Do, do you care about your soul? Are you heartbroken over sin? God weeps over the sin that's in this world. Does, are you desensitized to the point that you don't care about sin anymore? Jesus, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you don't care. Do, do you care about your neighbor's soul? I mean, Jesus tells us, love God with everything you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you care at all about the people that God brings into your life? Do you care at all about the people that surround you this morning? Are you only focused on your own comfort? Do you care about your neighbor's soul? Do, do you care? We had this morning, I was so grateful. In 830, we had three baptisms. Do you care at all about baptism? Do you care at all about people coming to the Lord? Do you care at all about Jesus' church being awakened by the breath of God? Do you, do you care at all about being revived out of this inert state? To be raised up out of the valley of dry bones? Do you care at all? And Jesus is saying this to the church. It's interesting. He gives us some sort of indicator of where our, our lethargic nature comes from. He says, the church, you, you haven't cared because you have too much. That you have so much and you live in comfort, you don't care anymore. So if you look down with me, verse 17, Jesus says, you say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I have need of nothing. Now, to be fair, we don't say those exact words, but that is our heart. We've never known what it's like to be in need. We've never known what it's like to be really hungry. Everything has been handed to us, and we have all the comforts that you could imagine. Air conditioning, indoor plumbing, cell phones, cars. This is absurd wealth that we live in the most comfortable era 
in the most comfortable place probably ever. And, and Jesus says, You're, you have too much. And because you have too much, you don't care anymore. He said, this, this is the message to the church. You don't care anymore because you have too much. And then listen to Jesus in verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous and repent. Jesus is saying there's corrective action here. He's saying, church, come near to me. You, you have opportunity to, to repent of this and, and be made whole again. Church, do you care? Do you care at all about the things that God cares about? And as you, you hear and know this correction of Jesus, he's saying, I love you. That's why I'm telling you this. That's why I'm warning you. This is why I'm speaking this to you today. Because I love you. And I care about what's next for you. Be zealous and repent. And that's our word this morning as we, we come to the Lord's Supper. In fact, deacons, if you would go ahead and begin to prepare the table. One of the things that we do as we come to the Lord's Supper is we want to make sure that we take it in a worthy manner. In 1 Corinthians, as the Apostle Paul is describing the Lord's Supper in the church at Corinth, he warns them. He says, don't take this in an unworthy manner. And through the millennia, as this has been passed down to us, there's different churches who've handled that in different ways. But one appropriate way to handle that is we want to make sure we have spent time in confession and repentance before the Lord before we take of the supper. And so we want every believer in here to have the opportunity to take the supper. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we ask you to refrain. But if you are a believer, we want you to take of the supper. And we want you to do that with a repentant heart. And so whatever or however God's working on your heart this morning, where that correction has been in the last couple of weeks, I hope you'll receive that correction. And ask the Lord for forgiveness. Say, for, forgive me and transform me. So we're going to have uh, just a few moments of silence. And then I'll, I'll close us with our prayer of repentance. So let us pray. Father, forgive us. There were many times, even this week, where we spurned your discipline. We talked back to you. We ran away from you. We threw a fit. We closed our eyes. We plugged our ears. And Father, for every way that we have defied you. We, we pray that you'd forgive us this morning. Forgive our hearts for turning away. Forgive our hearts for taking the easy way out. Lord, and we pray that your spirit would transform us. Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity to repent. We know you have been patient with us. You've stuck with us. And for that, we say thank you. And Lord, we, we trust that in the power of your spirit, we would receive your correction this morning. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us turn now to the table as the deacons come and serve.
As we come to the bread, it's, it's remarkable that God said as his children, he just asks us to ad- admit our failure. And when we come before him in repentance, we are completely forgiven. And that's because of the work that was on the cross. It's not because of anything that you have done. Your, your forgiveness is not in your accomplishment. But your forgiveness is found in the accomplishment of Jesus. That's why when he was walking towards the cross, he had this moment of the supper. And he told his disciples to tell the church, remember this moment. Because this is where freedom is found. This is the moment in time when guilt was wiped away. That every single one of you can know forgiveness, purity, redemption, hope. Because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so Jesus said, remember it in this way. First Corinthians describes the supper like this. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. And the Lord Jesus in a night in which he was betrayed... He took some of the bread, and he gave thanks for the bread. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Deacons, come and serve the cup.
You see from the earliest pages of Scripture that blood is life. And that our, our lives in our flesh and in our sinfulness become overwhelmed by decay, defined by death. But as we come to the cross of Jesus Christ and know his blood, we find new life. And so Jesus continued. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you have not left us on our own. Lord, we are thankful that you have not disowned us, but you have been patient and kind and 